Good morning. We're starting before six. But since New York is only six hours ahead of us now, it's uh, just midnight almost there. What's fascinating is the two, the two pictures I just sent you, this is the northwest direction here over Lebanon and there's so much light in the clouds and where the sun is coming out here on the east it's all dark but at the moment I took that picture there was still some opening between the level of the Golan and the clouds and so you had that beautiful light effect but the clouds closed it out very quickly. So who knows how this is going to be. We'll keep our eye on it and see when the sun appears. I thought it was going to be completely dry, but I discovered there was some rain. There was actually even water uh, back further on the parking access here of the camping ground. And it wasn't so damp over at Magla, so I'm not going up on Mount Arbel because I'm sure it got a good dousing with some shower, or very probably. So we leave that for another day. The rain that was promised for today was not on the program on the prognosis yesterday evening, and yet some came, so not much. So we'll stay on the dry. Lots and lots of cloud there. And there's actually lots of cloud in the readings. There's tremendous resistance. A resistance to God, a resistance to revelation, both at the time of Moses and the time of Jesus. The whole theme of resistance in the human heart. Sometimes, even among human beings and friendship, especially in marriage, a resistance to talk to each other, maybe even among siblings, between neighbors. Something has happened and there's a deep resistance. The mystery of resistance in the human heart. And yet with these clouds, the Lord can do his artwork with these difficulties. And that gives us great confidence. We have a perspective over time. And we look back and we say, how foolish of them to make the golden calf, which is the story today. How foolish, how could, be this? how could they be so ignorant? How could they be so despicable? How could they be so ungrateful? How could they be so unrecognizing? How could they be so blind? But we have to be careful about throwing stones because we might be in a glass house ourselves. The human condition, the human heart, the battles we go through, the wrestling, That story of Jacob wrestling with the divine presence or emissary is so eloquent of our frequent condition, resisting. I wonder if there are peoples who open up more readily because there's such a variety in everything, maybe there are. But one thing is for sure, the Israelites, in a certain sense, chose to struggle with God, to resist. 
it, many of them, you know, you can't glo uh, globally um, paint that picture just with one big sweep because you have Abraham, you have Moses, you have the prophets, you have Hannah. But there's been a very, very clear history of resistance to God. And you know, there's a gift for us in that because it tells us that even the most resistant won't stop God doing his purpose. You know, if you're kids playing on the court and, you know, the, the great basketball player among the kids, what satisfaction is in beating up a kid that doesn't know how to hold the ball in his hands or doesn't know how to dribble? But he beats a, a good one, you know. The, when there's a, a great game is when there's a great, a great uh, challenger. And God wanted to show us that he wants to take on everyone. He wants to take on everybody. Nobody is outside of God's reach. It's a great thing about then people like Mary and Joseph. You know, Mary is the exact opposite of that. Mary is such an example of openness and docility full of grace. Zechariah had his moment of resistance in the temple. And then some souls open up to God relatively easily. God pushes a little bit and they open up. But other souls struggle, struggle. And they resist. And they don't, they seem not even to open a little crack so the light can come through. It's like some children in a tantrum. And I think there are some periods when children have a period of tantrums or a time of tantrum, a time of rebellion. I don't know, it was three or four years of age or... I know some teachers love teaching uh, in America would be fourth, fifth graders because they're just so ready to learn and they're so cooperative and... But then you have the teens, you know, the sophomores. I remember it was not so easy. They were going through an inner turmoil, an inner self-discovery, a sense of purpose. Why am I here? Why am I doing this? Does it have any meaning? It's not so easy to learn diligently when you're in that situation. I remember one school in Ohio, there was a, a teacher teaching fifth graders and he always asked to teach the fifth graders. And he loved teaching the religion class because they were so hungry and so thirsty. So this whole theme of resistance to the light, resistance is saying, wow, this is really getting beautiful. Look at the light coming out here from the clouds. So when the resistance then begins to, to let cracks open up and yield to God, when a spouse that has been playing very, very hardball and agrees to become more open to dialogue with the spouse, more ready to encounter, more ready to smile, to be generous and give a smile in the eyes because sometimes there's that hardness. I don't want to be kind and generous because I feel so hurt or I feel so not taken into account. And there's that whole chemistry and physics of tension, of cold war, of hostile heart. Hey guys, this light is amazing. Check it out. I wonder if I should go to a different spot. Let's, let's walk down a bit more here, but this light's absolutely fascinating and it's going to become more so, I think. <laughs> hey guys, look at this. And the wall of resisting cloud breaks down.
Jesus is being powerfully resisted, and that resistant resistance matures uh, into his total destruction, apparently on the cross, crucifixion, with the most ugly, cruel punishment, if you will, punishment is not the right word, aggression, assault. The amazing thing about the heart of Christ is openness to the Father. I always do what the Father wants. You know, Jesus is absolutely the epitome. I mentioned Joseph and Mary, you know, Joseph in his dreams, he always said yes to the angel. He did the inspiration, he was supposed to take Mary, he was supposed to go to Egypt and so forth. Um, he, uh, he was very, he was supposed to come back, go to Nazareth and not to Judea. You know, he was accepting the instructions of God. He didn't wrestle with God. He looked for direction from God. And, and Jesus, of course, is the maximum. And Mary advocates that. He says, do whatever he tells you. Don't resist Jesus. Don't resist Jesus. That's Mary's instruction. Don't resist Jesus. In that light, it's really beautiful to read the, the Gospel today. And all of the Gospel, even the resurrection, you know. Thomas, <laughs> unless I put my fingers in his wounds and my hand in his side, I'm not believing. I'm resisting. It's not possible. It couldn't happen. How could you say he could rise from the dead? Give me a break. The Romans crushed him. Nobody wanted him here. Hey Thomas, put your finger in my hands, put your hand on my side. My Lord and my God. You know, the resistance broke down. Our mind can be so clouded, our will can be so fuzzied, so rebellious, so demanding. It's my ego determines reality. I'm resisting the truth of the matter, of the fact, you know. Isn't there that process, you know, the famous Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five steps of processing bad news, you know, really bad news, traumatic news, tragedy, denial. It didn't happen. No, it can't have happened. I can't believe it. No, no. he can't have died. No, it's impossible. You know, it just didn't happen. So all that denial of the thing. It seems to be part of our process. And that's why it's marvelous then when a people who made a golden calf, God can work with them. Like how many people today are making golden calves and you want to write them off the map? No, work with them. Work with your teenager, work with your husband, work with your wife. Don't write off the resistant, God doesn't. That's the conversation actually in the readings today. You know, God is really testing Moses there, you know. I'm going to destroy this people and start a new people with you because you're the good guy. Yeah, God, start the new party with us. Start the new church with us. You know, this is such a human temptation. How many people have went off and started a new church? Once I was with a family in Ohio <laughs> and, uh, and the lady, well, she was part of a women's group and she said, you got to meet my husband. He's in another church. And I said, sure, delighted to. And uh, she said, it won't be easy. And so we got together. We, I think there was a little dinner in the family, you know, we were chatting. And, and uh, so I said, tell me about your church. It's very, very interesting, you know. And he said, oh, we had a great pastor. He was a great pastor back in the 1920s. That's 100 years ago, people. <laughs> it goes around quickly. I wasn't there at the time, okay? My dad was. So... He was alive at the time. So he was doing great work. And then he had this amazing gift in his heart to go to Africa, to be a missionary in Africa. And he goes to Africa and he's spreading the gospel with great delight, you know. And then he comes back, you know, he's probably in more senior years, maybe he's turned 50 or 60 or something. And when he comes back to America, he discovers all kinds of drifting from Scripture, all kinds of acquiescence to 
hedonism, to mammon. It wasn't the church he remembered anymore from the from the twenties. It was uh, it was uh, a church in decay, a church, you know, allowing divorce, uh, church contraception. Abortion still was not on the agenda at all. Neither many other things. So he decided, well, I'm going to found my own church. You know, I, I, I understand his intentions. He's going to read the Bible, they're going to talk together and everything, but you know, we're in the pilgrimage right now, we're talking about the work of the Holy Spirit and the church. What is the church? I think these are oleander, one lady told me from England, she was a volunteer here. And I think she called them oleander, and I think somebody told me that last year as well, but I forget. Well, anyway, so he found it. So he, and I said, when did he found the church? And he said, it was 1957. I said, oh, I was two years old. How do we work with resistant communities, with resistant people? And the first thing would be to realize that we are resistant ourselves. We have had our chapters of resistance, our chapters of cloudy thinking, our chapters of rebellious mind and heart many times, you know. And how God is merciful with us. How do we give witness in a resistant community like Moses did? Even his brother Aaron was implicated, the high priest. He was implicated in the golden calf. And he was just as effective with excuses as Eve was, as Adam was. Adam, oh, Eve, Eve gave me, the woman you gave me, she was the problem. Oh, the snake was the problem. <clears throat> oh, Aaron, my brother, was a problem. You know, we love passing the responsibility to others. I don't like being blamed for anything. I personally don't. It's a very uncomfortable feeling, especially if it's a serious matter. We love letting ourselves off the hook. How do we deal with resistance? And there we need God, you know. Uh, that famous Psalm 95, right? Oh, that today you would hear his voice and harden not your hearts. My dad would say, hey, are you kids hard of hearing? <laughs> like, I asked you to do something and you didn't do it. Like, are you hard of hearing? You can't hear me. Well, it's not that we couldn't hear him. It's that we didn't like what he asked us to do. Harden not your hearts as a father did at Meribah, the day of Massan, the desert, when they tested me and provoked me. Testing God and provoking Him. Imagine, imagine us little creatures, little like dust you are and unto dust you shall return. You're made for glory, but you are dust. And we're resisting the creator of everything, the redeemer. How we need a lot of prayer, a lot of humility. A lot of spiritual growth. And the faith, the faith, the pilgrimage and faith in the spirit of Abraham, our father, the ability to be able to wait for God's moment. To be able to bear those who are resisting, who are countering the gospel, who to live with them, to continue living with them, to live with the resistant. To have that patience, those broad shoulders that I turn my face like flint, Jesus says in Mark's Gospel on the way to Jerusalem. You know, he's going to, he's preparing his heart for suffering. It's part of the vocation of being a witness of God.
Imagine at Capernaum, and Jesus himself, you know, it's not just Moses. Jesus himself is in the synagogue in Capernaum, and he teaches about the Eucharist, and the resistance is massive. They all leave, and Jesus turns to the disciples and says, are you going to leave too? God is not going to force us. The only way he's going to force us is he's going to die on the cross for us and say, look at me here, and I did this for you. Are you still going to resist? But Jesus lets us walk away. It's amazing, you know, this, all this language of God's wrath. God's wrath is, is uh, his, his self-giving. He wants to win us at every cost, just like parents do for their children. And parents have limited hearts. We're human beings, you know. So we see parents uh, making big sacrifices for their children. And maybe the children will afterwards have rebellious moments and forget what their parents did for them. Who doesn't bury their parents and regret that they weren't kinder, that they weren't more grateful, that they weren't more appreciative? Honor your father and your mother. You know, that's such wisdom, such wisdom. Look at all the light coming out above the clouds. And I'm sure in God's plan, he's bringing a lot of light out from behind our resistance. And we'll see it in eternity. How he grew in the experience of his mercy and his love. People, that's just an amazing sky. No wonder God tells us, don't judge. And to take out the, the splinter from our eye before we take out the plank of our brother's eye. Is there something wrong with that statement? Because <laughs> I always think I just have a splinter and my brother has the plank. I imagine some people are getting some nice screenshots here. We came to the end of our trail here, people, basically. I didn't want to lose the sun, so I didn't go down to the very, very end. I could keep going there, but I think this light is too beautiful to miss it. So, in a certain sense also, you know, we're a little bit helpless in front of our own hearts to a degree and we need to go on our knees and pray. That's the pilgrimage and faith is also a great blessing in that sense. It helps us to, to 
open up our hearts. Prayer softens our hearts, just like rain softens the soil and prepares for new growth, new seasons of seeding and renewal. I think today the theme is the church is uh, also is apostolic, to be an apostle. And it's so easy to be an apostle to nice people who appreciate you, but to be an apostle to people who reject you. And that can also be in many families today. Families of devout members can have great opposition in their own family. And to be there giving patient, gentle, kind, persevering witness. The church is apostolic. We're sent to everybody. And we're not sent out for lots of applause and appreciation. We're sent out to give witness. How many have given the witness of their whole lives? These are the great witnesses to be uh, sent out. Why am I sent out? How am I sent out? How am I going to go out? How is my heart when I go to the supermarket? A little prayer in my heart, Lord. When I go out today through kindness, a smile, letting somebody in front of me at the cashier, help me to give witness. Somebody that's looking for something and can't find it. Are you looking for this? Would this be what you, what you need? There's one lady here in Haifa, and she's incredible. She's always finding people at the dentist, at the beach, at, uh, and she's on her years. She's a mature lady. She has a big, big smile, takes up half her face. <laughs> and she's always telling little stories about people she meets, the most unsuspecting people she meets, and she's always doing, she's getting to nice conversations because she's uh, such a, a bundle of joy. I'm sure she has her issues. If you go to a dentist, it's not because you don't need to, <laughs> usually. And in the most unexpected places, you know, there we're sent. Moses had a tough time dealing with that people. He had a very special experience of God. So he had a great gift. And he interceded with God for mercy for his people. Imagine an apostle like that. Somebody that's, that's sent out by God. You are the salt of the earth and the light of the world to intercede for the people who are resistant. To beg God for them. What a heart of mercy. A heart of love. Lord, change my heart, soften my heart, not just for you, but for everybody, even for the criminals, for the human traffickers, for the drug lords. Let me be a blessing for them. Let me bring your rain and your light down in their lives so that their fields can bear wonderful crops, so they can continue experiencing your goodness, so they can open their hearts one day. Lord, reduce the evil people do so that more people don't suffer horribly. Lord, I'm here to help. Send me, Lord, send me. Thank you, people. Thank you for this wonderful morning together. You know, if you guys weren't there, you, I wouldn't be coming out here. You guys got me out here all this year. Oh, yeah, I'm turning the wrong way here. There we go. So thank you, God bless you. See you later, alligators. <laughs>